See, that's how it okay. works. You see me? Yeah. Okay. So that background, that's not a loft in, in a warehouse. No, not at all. This I had this image that you have the downtown studio and it's this huge warehouse like what the girl in Flashdance has. So you have the art section, then the martial arts section, and then you live in the rest of it. But that looks like a normal place. It's not a normal place. This is the upstairs of my loft. And can you see down the stairs? Ah, so I was right. Yes, and Jennifer Beals is in the kitchen right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> good for you. Uh, you know, I... I um, how do you know dancing while I'm on the while I'm doing the interview? <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, episode number thirty-six of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues with Steve Brody. So if you are if you're um, watch, well, you guys will be watching the replay. So be kind enough to say where you're from and hit the like button, and then feel free to comment, like, and share whether you're watching it on Facebook or YouTube. It is appropriate, Mr. Grody that we engage in dialogue today, a day that lives on in infamy, because you are the infamous Steve Grody. Is that so? I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> That's why we see obscure Steve Grody. And a guy that I have known, confirm this for me. Um, I've known you since my first week with Inasano back in 1983 at Irvine, California. You were there, weren't you? 83 was not before oh, oh, oh 83 83 wow yeah i think so okay but before we get to that i have a burning question for you isn't graffiti illegal <laughs> um a lot of it is but okay. here's, here's here's the thing um you know, people, a lot of people uh, that are outside graffiti culture, which I've been documenting for the last 28 years, nonstop, mm -hmm. um, they'll say, well, you know, well, why, why do these kids do this? Well, first of all, everybody does something that makes them feel alive. Whether it's joining a church group, a political action committee, wearing a big cheese hat to the football game, um, or joining or being crazy enough to join, you know, a martial arts group. Yeah. Um, everybody does something that makes them feel alive. That's number one. Number two, what youth generation has not, as part of its identity, shown itself to be youthy or out of control or wild and crazy? We're, we're young and crazy. I mean, going back to the jazz age, you know, in the 1910, 1915, with that crazy jazz music and those short skirts and the drinking and the smoking, what are these kids coming to? Okay. Yeah. And then you had the, you know, the, the beatniks and the punks and the hippies and the gossip. So everybody does something that's rebellious to the youth generation. Then on top of that, if you take a uh, Western culture that so highly values the anti-hero, the yeah. person that lives by his own rules, the rascal who gets away with something, I mean, we love that person and, and people have grown up, grown up with that. When you put that cultural predilection, that love of the rascal, with the natural predilection of youth to rebel, holy smoke. Yeah. And what and graffiti is half half sport, uh, you know, one third sport, one third art, one third just getting away with it. And so what a great identity to seem like you're you know you're an art an art rebel. Or, and so that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that while there is graffiti that can be called vandalistic or that is vandalistic. There's a huge amount of graffiti that may not be legal, but it's not destructive. I mean, people say destruction. Well, if somebody tags a trash dumpster, the dumpster still functions. If somebody trag, uh, tags um, a traffic, uh, a, a temporary traffic barrier mm -hmm. or, or the temporary boards on a construction site, they're not destroyed. <laughs> they're right. still functioning. 
a lot of the best graffiti is out of the way. It's down the railroad tracks behind a building where the business, the people yes. coming to and from the business never even see it. Oh, so I see it. I see it all the time. When I take the, when I take, we call it tri-rail because it goes between Miami-Dade County, Broward right. County, and Palm Beach County. Right. And it starts um, at the airport and right. it goes through a, a warehouse section. Right. Then it goes to the Amtrak and um, uh, CSI railway uh, compound. Right. And then it continues on. So right. that's exactly true. Railroad cars and rooftop, you have, to be on, you have to be on the roof of the building or looking down at the building in order right. to see it. Now, where do they get the ideas for, for their images from? What, is that mushrooms or something? Uh, in some cases, mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I could name names. <laughs> By the way, do you do you edit this interview later, or is this just the whole thing live? Oh, I can I can edit whatever. Would you mind if I just took a second to get a, my book to show you? Oh yeah, go go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Jennifer, honey, try and keep it quiet. <laughs> that Jennifer Beals, I you know she really should get herself under control especially when I'm on the other end trying to do a, a dialogue episode. For people that are cross-cultural, this is my book. You might bring it closer to the camera. I can't. Oh yeah, I think I did see that. Wow, nice. Three and so half, three so and how, many, how, many, how, many books, how many books on graffiti have you done? This is the only one so far. I'm actually working on another one that's... I'm not surprised because... Let me, let me find the section of my notes where... Because now I'm jumping all over the place, which is why I, I, sent you, I sent you the chicken scratch just so you know that I put some effort into this. I believe you. <laughs> right? So four, four videos on trapping, four on self-defense, three on Kali empty hands, one on sectoring, one on modified chisau, one on hubud, one on seco ordibus, and one on street tweak boxing. Actually, there's 18 altogether. There's one, there's a short one, a half hour show I did on uh, overview of training progressions. Oh yeah, I missed that one. Um, and there, then there, there is the, um, the hidden use of forms. Hidden combat use of forms. Yeah. Now, what was, what's the story behind that one? Because you're laughing about it. I'm laughing about it because really that was um, my first teacher. My first, I started in 1973 uh, with, under Cher K. Lu, who was, you could not get more old school. He was actually raised uh, from the age of 14 to 28 in a Taoist temple before the revolution in China. Uh -huh. Okay, so that was traditional temple Taoist culture. And, um, you know, it could be very frustrating dealing with um, traditional, you know, it's just like you, you're, it's like it seemed like you could never do anything right. Yeah. But in any event, I did learn interesting things from him. And in um, 70, I think in 79, that's when uh, an elder brother of mine. Um, took me by the uh, Kali Academy in Torrance just to see the training there. And I looked at it and I just immediately thought, well, pff, man, I, I need this. I need this because I'm not getting what I felt was practical and direct training with, the, with my traditional teacher. Okay. And uh, so I started training in 79 at the, uh, at the Kali Academy in Torrance. And that's when my classical teacher left for San Diego, which was great because I was getting more and more frustrated. And I stayed in touch with him over the years, but when I started to do uh, tapes for um, unique productions videos, and actually it was Curtis Wong who told me at one point that when he saw my practical self-defense show that I was doing on public access, that he mm -hmm. thought, wow, you know, we, you know, maybe we could do something that would be of value here. And that was one of the things that got him into doing 
uh, his video yeah. series back then. In any event, it was one of my ways of kind of paying respect to my classical teacher. Okay. Trying to show how you could approach classical training in a way to get to wring the most use out of it. Um, I would not have had the understanding of the classical had I not done the training at that point, some, some years of training at the Kali Academy under Dan and Asano. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's what it was. And it, and it <laughs> Mark Balif was my partner on a bunch of those uh, videos, yes. but he was sick that day and I couldn't cancel the session. So um, Bill Gay, who I knew as a training partner, is a good guy from, uh, from the Vunak days. Right. He came in, but he was totally un, you know, had no classical training. So whenever he did a response, it ended up being very like, you know, like JKD Collie, you're trapping. Some things started to look very much like Lou Bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what, that's what that was about. It was, it was a way to kind of show respect to my classical teacher. What's, um, what's become of those two guys? Bill, I, I uh, you know, I haven't been really in touch um, really well. Um, I have seen some postings from uh, uh, Bill's wife, Lynn, and it seemed like, you know, family life and, yeah. you know, doing okay. Mark is uh, harder to get in touch with. I think I've left a message now and then. And, you know, uh, I, th I always, th Mark Balfe always had, he probably has a record for being on the most covers of magazines, <laughs> being the bad guy, getting yeah. the crap beaten out of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's he, true. You know, most people have, you know, look at all the covers that I was on, and he's like, look at all the covers I was on, going, oh! Yeah. I, I have another question for you. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, yeah. The color scheme, the color scheme in those videos, it seems as if you made a deliberate effort to be as far away as possible from anything vaguely resembling martial art colors? Well, it depends on which videos you're talking about. If you're talking about the original, the original, the first things I did, first of all, the first thing I did was essential self-defense one and two and hidden combat use of forms. That's what I believe were, the, were my, were my first things. Okay. And then when they wanted to, uh, to do more, and that was at, at the Unique Publications Videos magazine site, which was right near the, Bur across the street from the Burbank Airport. And so they had this place where they would do photographs of the magazine, but they were trying to use it as a soundstage. And it was not a soundproof building. And we, like every 10 seconds, there was a, a jet taking off. And it was like, okay. Another take 3,425. Yeah. And it was there, I mean, it was the early 90s, which is, might as well have been the 80s. I mean, the only thing we were missing, missing was a disco ball. You know, it was like <laughs> that the lighting and the color was not my choice back then. And then on some of the other things like um, Lubud, Sika Ordebos, Cheetah Sao, that was whatever background or lighting they had at the public access studios. Okay. So I was not in production of, I was not in charge of any of the, the wonderfully lowbrow uh, production values. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a couple of things came out of what you just described there. Do you remember um, Ted Lukai Lukai's early uh, videos from maybe the mid 1980s where there was no post editing because there are actual times where an aircraft flies overhead and they left that into the final product. Yeah, Ted, yeah, and I was there for when Ted um, did, I think, his thing on Palm Stick. Mm -hmm. And um, Ted Lukai Lukai uh, had so much knowledge and so much wisdom, um, but sometimes it could be, um, he would put it out there in, in I know what for the U, unique publications people was a little frustrating because you know he kind of walks in there he has six months to prepare and he says so what do you want to do today? 
he says, you know, here are a couple of my students that came into town. Let's just let's bring them on the video. And they're like, oh, man, come on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he uh, had uh, he had a lot of deep knowledge and yeah. uh, that was a real loss teddy and uh mark stewart did something similar to uh, years later i think the um the hidden the hidden use of of forms also did he? yeah he's got some okay. he's got some i think it's from an o okinawan system but most recently well for me most recently because i only saw it yesterday you know Michael Michael J. White? Yeah. Okay. I saw a clip of his where there's an MMA guy. So he's in the, he's in a martial art place, and there's an MMA guy with a bad attitude up right. in the ring or the cage, and right. he's down on the outside hitting a makiwara and then doing his classical karate forms. So the MMA guy start, starts giving him a, a, a hard time and invites him into the cage. So then they have this whole choreographed set because it's kind of like a mini movie right. where he's showing the functionality behind the classical uh, and traditional stuff. Right. And I think he just did that. Re I, I didn't check the date, but it certainly was not 20 years ago. Right. You, you know, so I find it interesting that that – Today, they're doing stuff that we, as in the JKD clan members, were doing two decades ago. Um, it, well, yeah, there's, there, there's a, th a theme, you know, and it's, it's interesting because Bruce, there'd be time when, uh, you know, Dan would talk about how students would, uh, you know, Bruce's would, uh, would come up to him and like try and buddy up by tra trash talking classical stuff. And they'd say, well, let's see. And he'd move around with them and he'd use the classical stuff on them. Yeah. Because he wanted them to see that it had to do with your, you know, your timing and your distance and your abilities even more than the structure. The structure matters, but it's your, your timing and distance, what you can do that was primary. Timing, timing and distance. Is that why, I got to scroll down to the section here. Is that why I invented timing and distance, by the way. Okay. Well, yeah. I invented timing, distance, and coordination. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, it. Okay. So timing and distance. Now this is a direct quote. To be specific, I think a lot of weapons curriculums are ass backwards. <laughs> what jackass said that? Oh wait. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So where, when how and where when how did you come up with that opinion and was dog brothers and or lameco escrima uh did that play a part um you know enough time has gone by that i'm not entirely sure you know there are some light bulb moments i've had you know aha moments that were very specific and clear but Lameco uh, was certainly a huge part of it. The Dog Brothers, uh, the little bit that I did with the uh, Dog Brothers, you know, uh, Eric Knaus, um, you know, he's, he did a, you know, he was doing a really good thing. He was just like saying, well, let's, let's just get out there. And, and uh, you know, so I have, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know you, how you don't have a lot of respect for Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and i have a very um a very clear memory kind of burned into my brain of him kind of you know airborne you know six foot whatever he is airborne <laughs> coming at you like you know like uh oh yeah <laughs> uh so the dog brothers certainly was part of that and my training with uh Edgar was part of that, and also just realizing that, you know, when you move, around, I mean, just the, whatever sparring was done, you you know, it's like what what comes out, yeah, what comes out, and that, um, and what can you do in real time, and so when I say things are are, um, yeah, I I maintain that if you were going to teach like I was saying in that post that you're quoting from, if you're going to teach somebody that you care about, mm -hmm. 
what you really do, and they're going to be in a confrontation, you don't start showing them counter for counter. You don't start showing them some broader drills and, you know, close range drills. You show them. I mean, the thing that, that I really appreciate about, about Edgar Sulite's training in Lameco is that his emphasis, his first and foremost emphasis was on the authority of the strike having a strike with authority and power and that, that, that meant something. So, I mean, one of the questions I would ask people that are doing more standard curriculum, that if you do stuff with uh, roof block and inside sweep and all that, here's a question I would like to know, I, the answer to. How many times have you had somebody strike at you full power, full speed and full power, not even in the flow, not even sparring, but just saying, okay, I'm going to hit you with a number one now. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Even doing just, and doing, and how many times have you done that where somebody's hit you with a number one, full power, full speed, so you just feel how that feels. Same thing with an inside sweep. Same thing with any of the blocks or strikes that people have done 10,000 times from doing the flow drills. How many times have you done it, not even in flow, but just isolating it and seeing how that feels under pressure? And then... You know, um, so yeah, so staying at long range and being robust and having a strike that's non-telegraphic, efficient, powerful, that you actually have functional footwork, which means that you know something about actually maintaining the range that you want. Yeah. Uh, that, that is something that's achievable, especially in the light, not of dealing with other really experienced stick fighters. But when you, th my first concern is what is probability? What is, what, so my first, one of the things is what is human, what are human combative instincts? I don't like to even start with what's the proper stance. Here's a, but what is, what is human combative instinct right. offensively and defensively? What does that look like? Yeah. Number two you know, what are efficient and robust responses to that? And you can't, you can't talk about efficient and robust responses without addressing cognition. The dirtiest four-letter word in all of martial arts is just. Well, just do your shrieking beetle technique. Well, just do your, you know, your, you know, snake comes from heaven technique, you know, whatever. I mean, it, we can't, we, we, it takes time and we have to say, what are the things that we can do within the limits of actual human cognition and our own personal cognition? How, how we have to know yeah. how fast or slow we perceive and can respond. So it gets into the five speeds, of, first five speeds of JKD, not of JKD, but of the, in JKD analysis. So JKD, there's, we, people have talked about JKD structure and things, but I think that one of the things that Dan said that I really, that really, I really loved along the way was he said, I'm not endeavoring to teach you a system or techniques as much as to give you the educated eye. I want to give you the educated eye. And that means understanding something about structure and efficiency mm -hmm. and this relative to that and where things work and fail and, you know, what the strengths and weaknesses of things are. And that that's one of the things that I really hold to. I mean, and there were a lot of times when Dan would show variations of, of techniques and I, and he left it to us to say why, and he would say, well, you just got to kind of got to feel it. And I thought, well, I want to figure out specifically why you would use this versus that. And that's something that I've always done, you know, is tried to figure out, well, why this and why that? You know, and then that has to be attached to a feeling and, and a response so that you're actually seeing things in the moment. It's incomplete until you're doing things thoughtlessly. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't, which doesn't mean that thinking is always bad in a fight because if you notice that somebody is always draw, it has a tell, that's conscious. And so the whole thing about thoughtlessness or mushin in the Japanese, no mind. Mm -hmm. it, there are a lot of times when you can be just, boom, you just move, there it is, in, instinctively without thought. But other times you can say, oh, this guy's got to tell. 
or I see that he has a habit and you can take advantage of it. You can set him up and take a habit, uh, uh, right. take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, regarding Mu Xin or no mind, thoughtlessness, a lot of times that's represented uh, is as this, this high ultimate state that comes after years of training. And that offends me deeply because it comes after years of training only if the training is really craptastic. You know, in other words, if you are, if you're teaching somebody set form all the time, then of course it's not going to be right away. But if on day one with a student, yeah, you give them choices where you're saying, okay, you know, like where you, once, once the day that I teach somebody the defenses that I like against a hook, then I'll also say that I'll, that's also the same day that I'll start faking my right and go with the left to see if they'll be halfway to one thing and go to the other thing thoughtlessly yeah. because they saw the response. So that no mindness can and should be cultivated on day one. That is hard to do or harder to do in a group setting. Um, Cause it's amazing how clearly you can explain the training method that you want students to do in a group. And they're, kind of doing what you were telling them to do, but yet they're still screwing it up. And so that's why, um, I mean, there are a number of reasons why I just train privately. You know, I'll do the occasional seminar, but I know I can accomplish something with an individual because I'm working with that person's brain and their body, and I can move with them in the way that I can give rise or yeah. cultivate responses. It's hard to do in a group hard to do in a group and I think a lot of curriculums have evolved in response to the mass setting where you're saying well okay we're going to keep dumbing things down until pretty much everybody can kind of do what we're getting them to do so so, so you have you always had an aversion do you have an aversion then to the idea of the big school and if you do have you always had that and is it an, a, a, just a personal aversion, or do you think that, that, that nobody should have a big school? I think, I think there are people with big schools, and I think that they, they do the best that they can, and they actually give people some, some good training. I think that it can be done. I think, though, that at a certain point, whether you are doing martial art or learning to play an instrument or learning how to draw the figure, you need a mentor. You need a one-to-one -one relationship with somebody that, has more experience than you mm -hmm. everybody needs to you know it's like one of the great you know when i was assisting dan the thing that felt that was the best thing of the whole thing was to feel his energy yeah to tease out with him and to feel his energy and to feel him sometimes instinctively try to zoom me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sneak in something. Did you ever tease out with him and he shut you down? No. No? I just That's what happened to me. I mean, there, there we are. And I'm, I'm starting to feel okay with it. And then all of a sudden, it was just like this wall that went up. And I'm like, what, what, what just happened there? That was cheese out. <laughs> you know, it was interesting because one of the things that he talked about, and I don't think it was, you know, I really tried to cultivate a certain ear for Dan because there were the things that he would say kind mm -hmm. of loudly, you know, appropriately to the class. Mm -hmm. And then there were things that he would kind of whisper. And those were always the things that he kind of didn't really want people necessarily to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Bernard Richardson says something similar to that. Yeah. And it just, and it was kind of because he was, I, you know, I don't mean to be cynical, but gee, I am. Um, <laughs> a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times he, he was so used to saying things and people not listening carefully. And, you know, kind of, so he would say things and it would kind of go, yeah. So I was, I, he would say things, I go, wait, 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 wait. And sometimes people would want to follow up on it if they did hear it. And, you know, and he, it was things that he didn't necessarily really want to talk about. 
but he would in just our interactions sometimes in demonstrating to the class there would be something that he would throw in i'd think and it was really thought provoking i think now that there was something he just did and and i'd, I'd really have to think about what was different mm -hmm. what was different about that the structure mm -hmm. of the timing and it was so that was you know that was that was interesting yeah right. there's i've always said that there's there are a number of dan's um I mean, just if you look at his handwriting, sometimes it slants to the right, sometimes it slants to the center, sometimes it slants to the left. And there, uh, some of the students that when I kind of mention this, you know, they, they get insulted. They like, you feel like, it's almost like a little religious thing that insulted. And I'm not saying anything insulting at all. It's not yeah. a put down at all. But Dan is a really interesting person. And he is by, by definition eccentric and interesting and he tries on different points of view um and it you know um because it's his way of kind of looking at things and from different points of view and, and analyzing things and and he's he's you know so he's a he's a, a, a fascinating guy what what are, are there are there any dangers then in the people who are fascinated by this fascinated guy are there any dangers if they cannot understand what's going on what he's doing and and i almost want to say that they take everything that he does just at its surface level yeah that's always a problem with it with any teacher i mean here's the thing there are people shall we be controversial <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, it's interesting because I felt, I felt very self-conscious. I felt flattered, but very self-conscious when that, um, whatever that video thing is that came out on Chi Kundo Masters. And here's oh, yeah. Dan, uh -huh. and here's Dan and Asano and here's me. And I was like, oh man, I really felt weird about that. You know, because first of all, the term master yeah. is just, is like nails on a board to me. What does that mean? I've arrived at some final stage of development. Does that mean I can never get hit by a jab? I wish. <laughs> I know a million counters for a jab. I can still get hit with a jab. Yeah. Um, and and uh, but like that's like hating gravity, you know, to to feel otherwise. So, um, and then in terms of Jeet Kune Do, you know, I've had the experiences I've had, you know, and I'll try and make this brief. Um, you know, if I show, if somebody looks at what I'm doing, they would say, well, but that's, there's a bunch of stuff that's not Jeet Kune Do. And I say, okay, fine, it's not Jeet Kune Do. And those same people then would say, well, yes, it is. If I said what I was doing was not Jeet Kune Do, the people would say, what do you mean? Look at all that, it's Jeet Kune Do. And I say, okay, fine, it's Jeet Kune Do. And then the same people would say, no, it's not. You change, yeah. you're doing this different and that different. And I'm like, fine. That's why I don't really call, I call it what, I, what it is I do. I call what it is I do, what it is I do. And there's an element, and there are, there's a principles of Jeet Kune Do, and, um, uh, you know, efficiency. So there was a time I went, I was unwise enough to go on a, a site, you know, and I, I, there are people that are sincere, you know, but it was a, it was a discussion site on JKD. Oh, okay. And um, actually, you know, it was Mark Stewart, who I, I really like and respect. And he was saying, you know, what about simplicity? And I was saying that be simple and direct is half the equation. I said that really the, the full equation is be as simple and direct as you can be and as sophisticated and subtle as you, and, and complicated as you have to be. Ah. And somebody immediately wrote in, no, 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 you're missing the whole point. And, and, you know, and I thought, you know, you're not listening. I said, as you have to be. You don't trap because trapping is cool. Right. You trap because the energy and the structure happens to be there. Right. And um, for example, uh, and Mark jumped right in and he said, listen to what Steve is saying. Be as complex as you have to be. And because otherwise there would be like one punch and one kick. But there's yes. all this different training that we do. Yes. Just for that moment of where the wind of a fight might take us. Right. And those are my favorite moments in all of my training. Those are my favorite moments when... I don't do something that I wanted to do and executed it well, 
But in the flow of things, I end up doing something that I totally wasn't expecting that I maybe have never even seen before. Mm -hmm. And that's actually why I have um, a blackboard, like a, a, a marker board. And I take the student over there and say, okay, so this is what we did. I'm writing it down for me. Yeah. Because I want to remember it or analyze it later. It's like, what just happened? I mean, that's where a lot of my curriculum has evolved from interactions. It's not evolved from what was taught to me, but what I have been able to observe in my own interactions with people. And then how, if I can make it, if I can cultivate that and make that a thing that I can really do consistently enough. And then what's the teaching method by which I can get a student to really understand that and have that skill. And so that, so a lot of my structure is based on my experience. So, but to get, again, to get back, get back to the controversial part, there are a lot of people, there, there are some people that are like, well, I'm, I'm a JKD person and I'm, I'm just going to do the curriculum. Well, word up, dude, you know, Bruce didn't teach everything that he did to Dan and Dan doesn't teach everything that Bruce showed him or that he's come up with the people. Right. He is happy to keep some stuff to himself. And he's made that very clear at a number of times. It's like, you know, when he said, you know, I've given, you know, 90% of my wisdom, but 10%, uh, 90% of my knowledge, but 10% of my wisdom. Well, the wisdom is the how you make it work. That's the subtlety of how you really make it work. And um, so it, Bruce was always looking because one system's basic is another system's deep, dark secret or doesn't even exist. Like the base of the way, that's why the whole thing with JKD is like among, you know, is like fencing with two, is the, the JKD hands like fencing with two foils. Well, what is that? What is that specifically? That's, that's the subtle, that's the subtle disengagements. That's, you know, that's the, the, the smooth line changes. Yeah. That's, the fencing, uh, the, the broken, and certain broken rhythm and timing distance with an economical line, that's the fencing aspect. And so Bruce was always looking for those different things and like somehow we're not supposed to on our own. You know, it's like, right. it's just crazy to not, to not, you know, so I am thrilled that there are people that are preserving curriculums Mm -hmm. and the knowledge from different eras of Bruce, I'm, I'm glad to see that. I don't feel particularly beholden to that myself. Um, yeah, because you, so the disrespectful you <laughs> in, in talking about personal martial art philosophy, right, said, first, what is my primary loyalty to? A particular system and the social dynamics that keep things bounded yeah right yeah uh, and then you talked about loyalty to a system and its logic is one of the most unfortunate if understandable impediments to progress so do we need to have a, a liberate yourself from classical Jeet Kune Do article absolutely that I was gonna actually was thinking about bringing that up to, to on in this conversation and i want to say you know liberate yourself from classical kali liberate yourself from classical anything yeah um so here's the thing in you research your experience that was meant to mean not just your experience but actually the experience of the 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 jen fan curriculum mm -hmm. okay ah uh, you know Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, but the caveat to reject what is useless is don't reject what you think is useless prematurely. Right. And I think that uh, any, any teacher has thrown out things and then somewhere along the line went, oh, can you come, can you come closer? Your, your volume's down a little bit. And okay. So, yeah. See, yeah. Stay. Yeah. If you can stay there. Yeah. Don't mean to scare you. That's okay. Being this close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dwight, I saw, I saw was that interview you did with the old Apple doll the other day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so, so 
always reconsider things, um, you know, but, um, you know, but yeah, liberate yourself from classical Jeet Kune Do. Um, you know, just feel free. It's just important to feel free to, to think about things, you know, and, and to not get into these weird camps of these people versus those people. I just, you know, that's why, you know, it's kind of like that, that, that old saying, you know, the more people I know, the more I like my dog. <laughs> you can apply that to martial artists too. And there are martial artists that I, that I like, but I generally don't want to hang out with martial artists and talk about what a badass I am. Mm -hmm. You know, well, if I was, uh, you, know, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. We, we bad. What, what, what do you like to talk about if you're hanging out with martial artists? Or if you did hang out with martial artists, what would you like to talk about? Well, it depends, depends on who that person is. I'm, I'm hoping that that person is, uh, maybe would have interests beyond martial arts. What are they reading? Uh -huh. what, are they, what are they reading about? What are their other th thoughts out in, you know, about the, the, the rest of the world? What are you currently reading? Um, I'm reading, uh, I just, I, there are a number of things that I've read. I finished a book on um, The Synaptic Self by Joseph Ledoux. Okay. Uh, which was interesting. Uh, so stuff on brain research and cognitive research is really interesting to me. I read a really interesting book on um, called Laughter, a scientific uh, investigation. That's not about humor. It's not about humor. It's about actually phys physiologically the development of laughter yeah. Yeah. and what that is and how that has to do with the development of speech in human beings. Nice. That's interesting. I'm reading a book now also on um, how to write about contemporary art. Okay. Um, that's interesting. And then there's always, you know, a stack of New Yorkers that I get from my wife. So, so three books at a time. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, yeah, different things. And, you know, so those are, I'm, I'm interested about human functioning and I'm listening to some podcasts. Sam Harris is a really interesting person with podcasts on just on culture and, you know, human development and some political controversies. And have you heard, have you heard him and uh, Jordan Peterson? I haven't heard that one yet. And he was just on this talk with um, this um, wine, this guy, this uh, biologist, really interesting. Yeah. And he was talking about how it seems like everybody has good conversations with Jordan Peterson, except for him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and Jordan Peterson is, again, one of those, he's, it's an interesting thing because, again, in the world of politics and culture, people, they want to they wanna feel like they're in the right camp. Yes. What, what, oh, and they're, they're worried about what to agree or disagree with. You know, it's right. like, well, you, you like, was, you felt that Jordan Peterson said something good. Well, he says some, some good things and some stupid things. And, right. you know, unlike, gee, me, you know, um, you know, people say, you know, who you agree or disagree with. I don't always agree with myself. You know, I, I, you know, I think things and I'm, I'm always trying to reconsider things and I'm happy and I'm looking. Here's the thing. Instead of looking to always see what's right, it's more interesting to look at where your stuff fails or where it can change or be improved. And that's where sometimes a student is really interesting because you have a way of explaining something. Yeah. And this student just isn't getting it. Yeah. And so you suddenly think, oh, wow, okay, I have to find a different way to work with the student or explain this so that they get it. Yeah. And, then, and then you have a new tool in your, in your teaching toolbox. Yeah. And maybe, um, even, maybe even something you learned about it from the student that, right. you know. Yeah, that, that, that brings me to, to, to something I just thought of. Um, a lot of times you can tell who influence when I watch somebody move, especially in the early days, when I watch somebody move, I could tell who they had trained under. And even today, I can tell if somebody has trained under Vunak. They have a particular type of movement. But you always had a distinctive type of mechanics. I always found I always found that. And so it's weird to hear that anybody ever watched me at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, see, here's the thing, right? 
Here's I, knew the thing. The, I knew I taught the classes, but I really wasn't thinking about anybody watching my movement. So it's, it's interesting. Oh, no, 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 no. See, I learned, I learned a long time ago, right? Don't watch the, the star, right? Watch the people around him or her. Then you really get to see what, what, is, uh, what is going on. But here's the thing, right? And, I, and, and I'm so glad that we got to do this so many years later. But I always wanted to ask you, yeah. When I've watched your videos, this is a broad question. Answer it as best as you can. How does your brain work? Here's, here's what I mean. Let me help you with this. Okay, <laughs> let me help you with this. this yeah, I do need help. The, okay, this is from, this is from um, the, the blogspot.com where, where the videos are listed. It says, all of these videos are packed with information. I don't show 20 repetitions of the same technique so I can extend the tape series. I don't include filler material or teases, but give an in-depth look at these subjects. So, strategy for going in-depth. How does your mind work? Well, thank you, first of all, for thinking that it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it comes out of, it comes really out of um, not just thinking about it, but teaching you. It's, it's interesting. One of the things, and I understand this from the, when Dan talks about without his students, he wouldn't grow. And I, I understand, I, there's a certain thing that you can grow on your own, but in the teaching of something, you end up coming uh, just in the moment. Yeah. It sounds like you're explaining something that you knew, but you didn't even understand it yourself until you started explaining it. And so um, I just, I don't know. I just, um, I, I think about what do people need to know? And uh, there are a lot of times when you feel, you, you learn a lot about when you do it wrong or somebody does something wrong. Then you're saying, well, what's right? And then you start to say, okay, what's the difference between using something this way or that way? And then how do I explain that? Mm -hmm. And so in terms of movement, there are times when I've seen myself um, on tape and I just, I just think, oh man, that was just a big bottle of weak sauce dog. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was just, and then there are other times when I'm not thinking. Right. And I move and I go, oh, yeah, that was, that was okay. That you felt, you feel it. Okay. I felt okay. That I, I, I want, a, um, I would want to cultivate a balance between precision and fluidity, kind of a precision fluidity in movement. And that's, again, it's, it's always a balance between, between elements. You want, um, a, a lightness, but a strength, but, you know, and, just a balance of these elements. And sometimes I achieve it and sometimes I don't. Um, but I, I just, I don't like just leaving something in a, in a sim, sim, simplistic is the term that sometimes people don't understand. They don't understand that simplistic means overly simplified. That means you've taken it too far and now it, you've taken away an essential character of something. Uh -huh. I want things to be understood in a direct way, but in a way that's usable. And, and um, one of the things scientifically that I'm really interested in uh, are the subjects of intrinsic complexity and emergence. And this is very, very relevant to Marshall, to any Marshall researcher. Um, anybody that's interested in, in martial arts in terms of growth, in terms of any of the, this issue. For one thing, everything at its very base has a complexity to it. Vision, we, we take vision for granted, yeah. but when you actually look at the scientific investigation of, of vision and how it's created in the brain and in the eye and, and how it's uh, the cognition involved with vision. Yeah. It's yeah. insanely complex. We take it for granted. Um, and then there's the, the, the issue of emergence. Emergence in science is the understanding that, um, they, that, that happened some, started to evolve a number of years ago where 
scientists were always going, well, what's the element? Oh, well, there are these things called molecules. Oh, wait, there's atoms. Oh, wait, there's not just atoms. There's electrons, protons, and neutrons. And then there's now the, the quantum world. And then somebody realized, well, but no matter how intimately you, you knew anything about atoms, you could never predict how that would all come together and end up being something like um, Lady Gaga. <laughs> you know, or something like, like human nature. Right. You could not predict human nature and human beings. You could not, under, no matter how well you understood molecules or atoms, you could never say, well, I can see how a thing is going to eventually evolve from this called Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. There's no way, or, or, you know, or borscht belt humor or whatever. You know, there's no way you could predict that. And it's the same thing. That's, that's why um, fighting, there's an intrinsic complexity to fighting, partly because, again, there's, I always like to say that there's a good news, bad news scenario about learning self-defense. And the, the, the bad news scenario is that no matter how good you ever get, no matter how much you train, you can still get sucker punched. Mm -hmm. You can still make a wrong perception or a wrong move and get knocked on your butt. The good news is that with proper training in very, very short order, in a matter of weeks and months, you can change your odds in terms of an outcome, in terms of a general average street fight. Because the average person is not like an MMA is cage fighter, right. you know, crazed Ukrainian monster yeah. or whatever. Yeah. He's, you know, the average street fight today looks like the average street fight a thousand years ago, like just, you know, and um, so there are things that can be done about that that really improve your odds. There are never guarantees. We wear a seat belt in our car. That doesn't mean we can hit a back of a truck at 100 miles an hour and, and you know, for half a second have the thought, well, I'm wearing a seat belt. How come I'm dying? Right. You know, it's like you, you wear a seat, the seat belt in crew, in improves your odds and the martial arts training is if it's good improves your odds um and so but that that a lot of that has to do with have for one thing having a realistic model of how people fight like i said what is human combative instinct before we even talk about stance what is human combative instinct yeah. then we can talk about you know why we stand a certain way why we move a certain way and why we're not in a horse stance or a twist stance or classical stuff because it's very hard to move that way at speed and adapt at speed. Mm -hmm. The very first things I learned in 1973, standing in a horse stance, were my outward circulating blocks and my inward circulating blocks. You know, that was, that was day number one. And that stuff is, it's not that it's useless, but it's very hard to use and adapt. The larger, there's a basic principle, the larger the movement, yeah. the harder it is to adapt. And that's why my eight gates or eight primary blocks are one, just like in JKD, two like in JKD, three, where my elbow was pointed out slightly and my mm -hmm. hand is raced behind my head, four, five, six, seven, eight. Instead of seven and eight, it's this, this because the, the, the ha, so-called ha pock or low pock sow slap parry, absolutely usable, but then it has taken my hand further away from the opponent's face or further away from coming up to do anything defensive here. I see. So let, you know, blasphemous, disrespectful me, those are my eight rather than the, the, the illustration, in, you know, one, two, yeah. three, four, gong sow, gong sow, low pock, low pock. You know, um, you know, not, and those are, there's a time and a place for those, but it's like, if you think, if you think, boom, boom, you know, that if, how little, how little can you move right. and still adapt to a flow of strikes that are coming in? That's just, that's a general, there's a technical question. So, um, let's say, right, imaginary scenario because I think you have something to offer. What if you were forced to, huh? That makes one 
Yeah. What if you were forced to advise someone who runs a full-time professional school? So yes, they want to keep people around as long as possible, but they also want to make the people functional as quickly as possible, yeah. but not make them functional and get rid of them. Yeah. Make them functional and keep them around. Yeah. Do you have advice or strategy for that person? Um, is there not depth of material? Yes, there is. There is. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, it's less a suggestion of strategy than it is the uh, inspiration and, um, and charisma of a particular teacher. That's why you can have teachers with big schools and what they're teaching is just kind of like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's like they've got all these students around and yet what you're looking at it and you're, you're, you're thinking, wait, where's the laugh track? You know, they're, they're, wait, they're, they're showing this seriously, this thing, but they have, they have the charisma and the personality to do it. So a lot of it has to do with that they feel about, you know, if um, it's, it's the way your, and your enthusiasm, your um, concern, that matters. It's like, you know, I would say to a person running school, if you care and you, and you make sure that people understand that you care about their progress, that's central. Yeah. Even more than the quality, that's, that's first above even the material you show. And then feeling, you know, uh, however you space it out, having a progression so that they feel like they're, they're making progress. And I really do feel that a lot of people leave martial arts, or especially more traditional martial arts, because they, even if they can't say, well, obviously this, this is, this is what's wrong with the structure, or this is why it's unrealistic. They can't put their finger on it, but they know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. They just, they think, well, God, I'm learning this stuff and it just doesn't seem to fit my model mm -hmm. of my experience of how fighting has been. I had a student that came from a very classical situation and he was there for a few years and he kept asking the teacher, well, how will I know? You're, you're telling me always do this or do that. We always did a set technique. They never did a drill where choice was involved. Yeah. And he said, I asked the teacher, well, how do I, how will I ever know what to use? He said, the teacher said, you'll know, you'll know. Like muscle memory is enough. Forget about it. Muscle memory isn't enough. You have to, you have to not just do re repetitions of motion, but repetitions of choice making. Choice making to me is the thing that is most under, it's not emphasized enough. Is not focused on enough. Okay. And he, so he left. And when he came to me, I realized at a certain point that he was always waiting for me to tell him what to do. So I started to tell him to do the wrong thing. <laughs> I started, I said, I said, Perry, you know, I'd, I'd throw a jab. I'd say, I'd parry, I'd say, Perry. And then, so he would parry, and then I'd start throwing a hook, and I'd say, no, parry. And he'd start, he'd start, and he'd start to cover instead of parry, because that's what he should do. And I'd say, no, no, parry, no, parry. And I kept telling him to do the wrong thing until suddenly this light bulb went on in him, in him. Don't ever listen to this guy. <laughs> do, do what you see you need to respond to. Watch right. and respond as their first, and that's why as a part of my training with any student I will always do stuff now it's it's understood don't just hit me in the face out of you know it's like I'm I because if I oh here's here's a really important point if I'm teaching somebody and I really want to show them what's what I have to be vulnerable mm -hmm. I can't if, if I'm gonna come in and show somebody how somebody kind of comes in with haymakers then I can't be having a guard I can't be guarding as I do my stuff. I have to let them do the punch with control, like or touching my chest, so that they stop hit this hook, but then I throw that hook so that they learn how to go from a stop hit or interrupt their stop hit and change from an attempted stop hit 
to a defense. Mm -hmm. Again, so broken rhythm needs to be worked on on day starting on day one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, but it got embarrassing because a student went to um, a, a there were like three teachers that were going to do a Google groups a group seminar, and he was asked by the teacher during this one point. I forget who the teacher was to help him demonstrate. And the teacher started to do stuff and he kept countering the teacher and he wasn't trying to, right. he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He just wasn't listening. He was just responding. Right. And he, he wouldn't let the teacher show. <laughs> he wanted to show. He said, and, I felt then, and then the guy said to him, who's your instructor? He goes, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why, that's why I love caller ID. I never answer any call. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, I, I, I want to jump back to um, yeah. way back in time. The gig as Inasano Academy assistant. Yeah. How did that come about? Do you, do you? Yeah, I'm, you know, it's, it's funny. I, it was in, uh, it was in uh, 85. Okay. And, um, and I, that's when I started assisting Dan and I'm not sure. I, you know, it's, it was so long ago. I remember there were horse and buggies, many of them. And, you know, it was 85 and it was at the, uh, so I had started in 79 at the Collie Academy on, in Torrance. Right. And then, and then Dan and Richard uh, Bastillo started the IMB Academy, which originally stood for Inosano Martinez Bastillo. And, um, and it was during that time that, I don't know, uh, Dan just started having me help him in the class. And I don't remember, I wish I, wish I remembered more about how that first happened. But, you know, it's like I didn't ask him, can I assist you? He just like he started to pick me out. I guess when he was picking out students mm -hmm. to work with, to demonstrate stuff, he, yeah. he felt that my energy was something he could work with. Yeah. And... Um, and uh, so it just became a thing where I assisted him, but then there were, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but there were politics going on. <gasps> <laughs> I know, Simpson crowd gasp. <laughs> and, um, and so that's, uh, that's when he actually had started the Marina Del Rey Academy yeah. as well. So he had the Marina Del Rey Academy and, and the IMB, and that's when he said, well, why don't, you know, you know, why don't you help me over at the, the IMB? Uh, not, not, the, not the IMB, but the, the Marina Del Rey Academy. Mm -hmm. And um, so, because there were just politics, yeah. which, which we could talk about off camera sometime. <laughs> it, was like, it was like a soap opera. And it was like, just, really? Really, adults? Hello? Uh, any adults in the room? Anyway, so, um, and... Um, and so uh, he, he specifically asked me, he said, uh, come on, why don't you come on over to the, um, the uh, Marina Academy and just uh, assist me there. And, and then there were times when that's when he started, you know, if he was on seminar or something, he would have me teach the class for them, for him. And, and that's, um, you know, uh, you know, there were times when he would come in and he saw me teaching a class. That's actually where, um, so you were back there back in, in the day. <laughs> Do you remember what? Do you remember what what Dan originally called, where you parry on the outside but hit up the middle? Uh, I know that as split entry. Yeah, that's 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 the name that I that he got for me. Oh. <laughs> originally, he originally. I mean, now there. I'm sure there's anybody that's there's like a thousand. You know, however many people are watching, they're indignant. <gasps> Who is this guy? You know, it's so funny because <laughs> I didn't invent the technique. I mean, but Dan originally up to the uh, late 80s called it either forked entry or inside outside entry uh -huh. because loy wong pak da is a mouthful yeah and so i didn't want to call it that so we called it forked entry or inside outside entry and i just always wanted to have if i could a single syllable so when i'm teaching and i'm moving around i could say split cut so the, the outside sliding leverage punch i just call it a cut yeah you know um, so if I parry on the inside of your jab or cross and hit, I just call that in. So I can say in, out, cut, 
POC, you know, so a symbol so I can move right. with somebody and have them do this stuff. And Dan saw that and, and it, it kind of tickled me that a few years later after not being at the Academy for a while, I saw all the Inosano people in the lineage using the term split and it just made me feel kind of warm. You know, like I said, <laughs> I did not invent the technique. Right. I, you know, I have come up with training methods by which I think that you can you see all that stuff to me. That's why I did the sectoring video. Yes. I called it sectoring because Dan never used the term ever. He never used the term time hit, which is what they are. But he would say, we can enter like this, and we can enter like that. And from here, you have this sector you can go to. From here, you have this sector that you can go to. Uh -huh. So I thought, uh -huh. okay, well, what should I call this? I'll call it sectoring. Uh -huh. But I always thought, those aren't just entries. That's a whole body of knowledge in and of itself. The relationship between those different initial mo motions. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I thought that's a worthy subject. I felt that was something where I could contribute um, a perspective. Um, uh, it has interested me and dismayed me a little bit sometimes when I've watched over the years. I mean, I wish I had just a ton of money to, to waste so I could get everybody's, all the material that's ever been published on Jeet Kune Do and, and Filipino martial arts. Yeah. So I could look at it once before giving it away. Yeah. Um, because it, it always, it dismayed me when I would see some of, some students in the lineage um, do something but have no perspective of their own, no new perspective, no shedding, no light. Right. And I was thinking, really? That don't, don't you have any, any personal understanding that you can share with us that, that would help us understand this further? Uh, it was just a regurgitation. No. You, 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 okay, you, because you know, what, you know what I think is, is happening? There's no absorbing of what's useful. What there is, there's adopting. There's a lot of adopting what you've been shown. So forget tenet number one, research your own experience. That's not happening. <laughs> Nobody's absorbing anything. They're adopting what they have been shown. Uh, there, there's, there's no rejecting what's useless because they're adopting everything. And then there is no add specifically what is your own. Well, I'm glad you're going to be getting some hate mail, too. <laughs> we'll, share, we'll share the hate mail. Yeah, right. That's, 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 what, um, that's what I see. I did, on, on a related note, when you talked about the vast awkwardness of weapons curricula, is there a corresponding problem in empty hands training? Um, you know, it's interesting. The... Um, not necessarily, because generally, thing, generally things start with kickboxing, mm -hmm. and I think that's good. The people that start on the ground, the, the grappling crowd, mm -hmm. the assumption, and it's not a terrible assumption at all, but the assumption is the two people are going to be both so equally good or both so equally bad that the kickboxing range is going to fail, so you're going to end up on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's true that if people are equally bad or equally good, that they can neutralize each other and end up on the ground. Mm -hmm. But again, looking at probability, if you're the person that really um, has trained in a responsive way and you acknowledge that there is a threat coming your way and you don't just get caught up in the deer in the headlights moment of what? Yeah. You know, but you see somebody, I mean, I've been, in that situation where I was hoping that something was just going to go away and then it just kind of came towards me and there's a line in the sand where you just, you go, I'm moving, mm -hmm. I'm moving towards you mm -hmm. and you stop it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so I think that, I think that kickboxing is more optimistic in a way because you're hoping that you can stop something at the kickboxing, you know, the, the kicking, kneeing, elbowing slash trapping, if you want, ranges. And I think that in street probability, that's not a bad idea if you are willing to act. You know, it's interesting that one of the questions that I always ask people, as I say in the, or in, in the first number of sessions is, here's a question. Is it legal for you to hit somebody before they hit you? 
And a lot of times they pause, first of all, which is telling. And second, because that means they would pause in reality. And then they say, well, no, I think I say, well, you're wrong. You can hit somebody before they hit you. There's legally a thing called fighting words. Yes. If somebody gets out of their car and starts moving towards you saying, I'm going to kick your ass like road rage. Yes. You get to stop them before they hit you or you get to stop them as they are aggressing towards you. Yes. There's also uh, people are unclear. And if there are any lawyers that want to correct me on this, my understanding that assault is not the strike that's coming. Assault is the words, mm-hmm. the announcement. So that's why they say assault and battery. Mm-hmm. Assault is me saying I'm gonna kick your ass and battery is me attempting to follow up or attempted battery is me trying to follow up. Yes. Okay, so it's important that people pre-fight. It's important to talk about before the fight. It's important that people understand that they have to be willing to engage if they feel threatened enough. That's, ex- that's martial existentialism 101. Mm-hmm. In, other words, in other words, society is not gonna keep you safe. Yeah. The laws are not, not gonna keep you. You are res- free and you are responsible for your, for your safety and you are free to do what you need to do that is appropriate. Of course, you know, if the police show up and you're still jumping up and down this person's head 15 minutes after they're unconscious, that's frowned upon. Right, yeah. I, I can. I, I can. Uh, uh, let me just tell you. I found. I have found out that's frowned up. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned that in uh, in in. I that's actually something I learned in classical uh, Japanese karate because there's a saying. Uh, I think it's karate ni sente nashi, meaning in karate there is no first strike, and people misinterpret that to mean that you don't hit first. But what it actually means is that if you are threatened. That's the first strike. That's nice. You see, and that, that's 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 where that's where I learned that. Uh, I have to tell you this as as we um, we get ready to to close this up. Um, where shoot, I lost it. Um, you get to edit. <laughs> yeah, finish finish this. Oh, there it is. Okay, it is a brilliant, br- but for some reason. Um, the font that I'm trying to render it in is giving me a hard time. Uh, oh gosh! And now, now the now the computer won't bring it up. But it says I should have just put it in another place. The computer is saying, "I'm sorry, Dwight." I know. I um, <laughs> okay, so here, finish the sentence. the The goal the goal is to ah. Uh, that's the goal. That was it. No, no. It says. It the says. Thing, the thing, by the, the way. Goal, the goal. It yeah, won't. Put, it while won't. You're looking for, while, while you're looking for that, I'll tell you something. If um, it was, it, it just reminded me of what Chris. I saw uh, some video that Chris Kent was talking about. You know that that it has to be more than just you know learning how to kick ass because if that's what you're doing your whole life and then it never happens and you're thinking, oh man, I never got into a fight. I was all, here's the thing. If a puff of smoke appeared in front of me and some spiritual entity knew my future and said, Steve, I have seen your future and it is not good, but I can tell you that you will never ever have to defend yourself again and then disappeared, I would still do martial art. Because it is, it is a, you can't do it Mm -hmm. without synchronizing your emotions and your cognition and your body. It brings things into um, congruence. It's like, you know, and some people maybe do it through surfing or skateboarding or whatever, where you feel, you have to be all unified, your mind, your body, your emotions, all that stuff. And so to me, it is, you're, you're surfing, you're surfing the other, you're surfing your training partner or your opponent, you're surfing, you're responding, you're seeing, and you know the, it, the, the feedback is immediate if you're not in the moment or not. And I love that. And because, and so there was a time, my sister, um, who I love dearly, as you know, as the good liberal was saying one time, well, Steve, you know, the, the, um, you know, um, you're, you, it's a self development part is more important than the self-defense part, right? 
And I'm like, well, that, but that's like saying what's more important, inhaling or exhaling. Yeah. You know, and the, the thing is, there is no self-development if it's not real. The self-development comes through self-examination, is what Bruce was saying, and it's true. You're learning about your emotions and your intellect, and over time, intellect too. There was a, this, a guy back at the academy in the early days who was watching people take notes. He's like, oh, <laughs> notes. You're going to bring your notes with you in a fight? And I was thinking, okay, you, you just told everybody here you're a complete effing idiot. Yeah. Because who are the two biggest note takers in, in history? Bruce Lee and Dan Innocent. <laughs> you know, taking, taking notes is a way you think about and process your information, but over time, and that's part of problem solving to bring into the moment. And then you think about your experience and then you go back to the drawing board. So here I found it. The goal is to cultivate an intuitive skill that yeah. has a chance to hold up in real time under pressure. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> do I have permission? Do I have permission to use it? You do. You have you absolutely do. And you just <laughs> as long as you whenever you use it, you show people a picture of me and my silk turban. Yep. Well, well, it will it will have the proper attribution every time I use it. So people Yes, people, I do. There is a stevegrody.com site where I actually blog at least once a year. <laughs> I noticed. I think the last one was in April. So I'm going to, okay, so because we're talking about this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post something within the next 24 hours on there and try and do something at least once a week so that people have a reason to come back. Yes. And I also have a little something on a Facebook martial arts page as well as my graffiti page, as well as my personal page. And, um, and there's yeah. new videos coming out. I am working on, I've been working for quite a while on my knife approach, and it is not, it will be novel. That's all I'll say is it'll be novel. Um, it won't be traditional. It'll be, I think, talking about things that are not addressed. And here's, and to be specific, here's a question. Okay. Origi initially strikes are shown, okay, this is number one to the head, number two to the head. And then we, we learn, oh, the number one, you can counter number one to the hand. You know, you can, in other words, when somebody's hitting you, you can stay along and hit the hand. Mm -hmm. But where in an organized way, how often do you see it address the issue of, well, okay, if I'm the person doing the strike and they're trying to smash my hand, how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is the 800 pound gorilla sitting in the room of Filipino martial arts. Right. Okay. You know? And yeah. so, um, so I want to address that. I want to, again, it's what I'm doing is what do I really feel? What do I really do? What do I really hold to? Not what is all the cool jazz, but what do I really hold to? And what's the subtlety and understanding the timings of things? Uh -huh. And then I'm going to do it with stick. And then even though double stick is not the most, most necessary, Thing to know about there are ways that you can do it that's more dynamic or less dynamic yeah. rather than just going clickety clickety click and then i'm just something on staff and then uh, an actual volume five on trapping that wow. which i think about calling actually advanced trapping okay <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned you, you you mentioned uh the double safety were you so you were present at the birth of the dog brothers you were right I, yeah, I guess I guess I was. I guess I was because I, I moved around. I sparred with Eric some at the uh, Marina Academy. I think before there was a Dog Brothers. Right. Yes. And then uh, at the time of the first filming, um, and um, I I wouldn't mind if all that footage of me sparring disappeared mysteriously. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I was around it, but I just. Um, I wasn't committed to doing that as, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a regularly scheduled part of things. I thought it was very, a valuable experience and, yeah. and um, you know, there were things to learn from it. But um, I think that people need to also just remember that training protective equipment is a, is a double-edged sword because the unfortunate thing in a lot of contact things where they have is you'll see when you, when not even having to slow it down, where you see people sparring, and first of all, it gets very telegraphic. So, is anybody noticing that? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any 
trying to correct that. And number two, are they, they're using the equipment to game the system. Somebody's getting hit in the head and then they hit back. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, that was realistic. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and it's not, and when I criticize people's bad habits, I'm not saying that I can't, like I said, they're instinctive. And so I work on them myself and I will never be beyond having a bad habit, but I, I work on it and that's something I'm working on. Anyway. Um, hard stick with helmet and padding, various types of padding, versus less padding and softer stick or padded stick. Uh, do you have an opinion on which one makes more sense? Uh, well, that, that's the thing, do them both, because you'll, both, you'll get something out of both of them. Yeah. So you, you, you learn one from one thing and, and another thing from another, but I'll tell you, even with a soft stick, smack in hand, full speed and power with a soft <laughs> stick not, is, is not something you don't notice. Right. You know, yeah. and, you know and, and that's why uh, there was a point where I'd carry a wiffle bat in my car with a wiffle ball because you couldn't have a club legally. You'd get sweated by the cops if they stopped you. Okay. Um, but, but if you have a wiffle bat and a ball, so I'm just playing ball with my nephew where they can't sweat you for that. Right. Without looking like a fool. Huh. So, but, but a wiffle bat, you know, or even, even just um, like a Tai Chi sword. Yeah. Well, what is that, sir? And you're back, oh, that's, I do Tai Chi Chuan. See, it's, it's Tai Chi sword. Well, it's still a real piece of wood. Right. You know, and, and so there, the, you know, so yeah, going back and forth between a soft stick, but try and triangulate your different experiences to make something realistic because we can't fully be realistic because, okay, Dwight, I want to be realistic with you. So we're going to spar and I'm going to finger jab you in the eye. Now keep moving right. because it's important to see that you can keep going. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to wrench your arm, but I want you to keep moving. Yeah. You have to, at a certain point, obviously it's not self-defense training. It's self-offense training, yeah. you know? And so we, we have to, we have to find a way to triangulate the best we can. And then, you know, my people that have been in situations um, have not asked for their money back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's evident. Um, all right, let's let's finish up with a little a little yeah. bit more uh, controversy. Yes, um, you were there when the split. Well, not the split, but you were there when when yeah the class the the class offering started to split. So there was separate this and separate that and separate the next. So, um, but you were not known for um, for being a Muay Thai exponent. Well, when when you say split could you describe the split a little bit more that you're talking about well um i seem to recall when the class schedule showed basics right phase one uh phase maybe phase one and two and then and then phase three and then it started to be separate muay thai separate pendrak silat separate even uh box from says um maybe separate uh shoot wrestling yeah Okay. Right. So how come you're not known as right. an exponent of those things? Because I don't do a lot of those things. <laughs> I haven't talked about a lot of those things. I'm not. How I'm dare not, you? You know, I am, um, you know, I, and I'm not saying that I don't do them because there's not value. Um, uh, I don't do, uh, you know, I think there's some really interesting specific idiosyncratic things to um to to la basse française uh and um but i just didn't feel like you know i'm i'm too lazy okay you know, i'm gonna go for the stop kick <laughs> <laughs> you know and and uh in terms of muay thai you know i did the training that was there yeah um and and i got what i get out of that um but I don't, so there are elements of that that I bring into training, but I don't feel the need to make it a, a, a whole thing. It's, it's interesting that in, um, 
and then in the shoot, I did the shoot training when Dan did it, and that was, and I, I left before he started with the Machados. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I think there's a lot of really, it's an interesting world. The, the ground world is really interesting. Yeah. And I didn't really get, uh, my ground game is, is, is not strong. Uh, and it's not because it's not a worthy thing to investigate. I just, at a certain point in your life, you're saying, what, what do I want to do with my time? And there are other things to do. And even if there's value to it, there's just other things that I, I want to be doing with my life rather than you know, rolling around it. And here's, by the way, here's a thing that I would, a challenge that I would like to issue um, to all martial arts instructors. Um, and the challenge is there's so much stuff that we can show and more and more and more and more stuff. Right. But what I would challenge people to say is what to know what is your one page essential? What can you show people that is the most essential that they can get the most use out of in the least amount of time? Yeah. So in other words, there are a lot of people that are like, well, there's all this grappling and stuff that's so important. Yeah, and what do we say to people that don't wanna be rolling around on the mat two hours at a time, three days a week. What do we want to tell average citizens that want to know something about, it's like you don't, do you have to be a top brain surgeon to know first aid? No, it's really good to know first aid without necessarily having to be a doctor. What is the first aid of self-defense? Mm -hmm. And um, so we can say, oh, here are all these different things, but what is the most essential and how essential can you be and still make it useful without going down all these other little branches and and details and where we get lost in the woods yeah. and, yeah. and start to lose the essence of things you know not and also just remembering that the average you know well i didn't see those people using it in the you know ufc well yeah but a lot of people are not big bur bbgs uh, bbgs big burly guys <laughs> you know that want to beat the crap out of each other Right. What, do we, what do we give to average citizens? Is there anything we can give to average citizens? And I think there is. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 I, I was there at, a, at an interesting time. And I mean, I'm sure it's always interesting. But um, yeah, was there, was there a question about that separation of things? That no, no. The, quest, the question was, uh, you're not being known as an exponent or uh but see but that's because you're you're the infamous steve grody right? I'm, I'm interested in being as efficiently lazy as possible yeah what's um, the least i can get away with and make be functional okay so now i am going to i'm going to ask you a challenging question right uh -oh. so let me uh -oh. let me let me set it up the answer lies in the pages of this book and as soon as I read what you had written about, here's another quote. They start with middle or close range, of course, without asking how you ended up that close, and then somewhere down the line, dealing with long range. Now, as soon, now this came about because you were talking about the vast awkwardness of weapons training. On the pages of this book, there is a story related by Dan Inosano about weapons training when he shared the information with someone. And that someone's answer validates what you wrote. Um, well, I don't know if it's in that book, but probably um, Leo, uh, Leo Giron. Uh-uh. Uh um, uh, or Illustrissimo. Uh-uh. Nope. It was, it was Bruce. Bruce Lee. Oh, it, was Bruce. it was Bruce where he was talking about, oh, oh, well, Dan, if you, if, if you, I, I hope that you've had a chance to have Dan demonstrate how he tried to teach Bruce Colley because it is, it's roll on the floor <laughs> because he's like, you know, Bruce, he comes back from being with La Costa and Bruce is, you know, like, well, you know, what are you learning? And he's kind of suspicious that it's just going to be, you know, what? 
yeah. even though he told Bruce, you know, you should learn, you know, you should find out about, you know, this guy, Ben Largusa, that was really great at the uh, Long Beach Internationals. And he kind of turned Dan on to the interest. But then he was also like, well, what did you, you know, and Dan says, well, I'll, I'll show you. Um, they tried to show Bruce an inside sweep, you know, and Bruce was just kept moving away and just bam, 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 bam. Well, this is what I would do. And he wouldn't let him show him. Right. <laughs> he was right. like. Because, and in, in, in the book, he says that Bruce Lee ad-libbed Largo yeah. Mano. Yeah. Long range. Yeah. So as soon as I read that, I go, oh, my God. I should have remembered that right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's the thing. And that's what he does in um, basically in, uh, in Enter the Dragon. Although he had, um, he was often using kind of a movie stop rhythm then mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. You know, choom, 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 instead of you know the, the 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 kind of rhythm that you would really want. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in any event, uh, you know. So this is this is of course where some jackass is going to write to me saying, "So you think you could have kicked Bruce Lee's ass with a stick?" Huh? <laughs> uh, you know, people are just waiting to just they're looking for something to be offended by. In any event. Um, yeah. So absolutely. So Bruce was basically doing. You know. Um, Largo, um, yeah. you know, he did do also some things with the double stick where he'd go block and then hit, which was basically the corners, the, you know, the sil the, you know, the, you know, an outside go boom, go ba boom, you know, but, but yeah, he was, he was doing Largo with the, and with the staff too. Yeah. You know? So, right. it's, uh, yeah. Okay. On that but, note. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm checking here. I just started doing something with you that I never did before. What, um, like, I would jump around on my questions. Snapchat and having funny faces on me while we're talking? <laughs> no. Um, no, what I started doing was uh, a way of checking off my questions, right? Uh, I just turn it from regular font into bold. Ah. Uh, and I've gone through just about everything with you that uh that i wanted the only thing you know what i didn't cover what um have you done research on your name your your last name it's uh, the, actually the name is Gor gorodetsky gorodetsky is the way it would be pronounced in russian it's ukrainian oh so so grody is even though it means something disgusting <laughs> yes i found that out okay. <laughs> um uh it would be a great name for a punk band singer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm Steve Groding. Ah! <laughs> um, um, it's actually shortened. My grandfather shortened it from Gorodetsky. He actually made it through Ellis Island with the Gorodetsky intact. But uh -huh. then when he came from, um, from uh, New York to uh, San Pedro uh, in the uh, early part of the 1900s with my father um, across the country, he changed it to Grody. Um, and uh, so, uh, classic, um, you know, uh, Jewish Ukrainian uh, exports. Um, my sister has this uh, uh, imagining that he left New York after running a successful garment business and moved to San Pedro because he somehow got in in trouble with the Jewish garment mafia. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he changed his name. Anyway, so yeah, so that's. That's that's the basic thing with the name. Okay. Although the ski, some people say, means we were from Poland somewhere along the line. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and the, okay, so here's here's the, the the well the absolute last part. It isn't really. Who would you recommend I try getting onto the program? Guy Chase. Have spoken to him already. I'll send you. I'll send you the link to to his episode. Yeah. Um. And there are. You know, well, you put me on the spot, you know, because I... That's my job. And I'll have to, I'll have to think about it. I mean, because there's certainly, there's certainly good, good people out there, um, you know. Well, I don't foresee myself ever running out of guests. Right. I don't see it. It's not, it's, I, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I mean, there, there are a bunch of people, um, so I just want people to know that if I'm not coming up with your name, it's not because I don't think that you were just <laughs> the best thing since sliced JKD bread. <laughs> but, um, 
you know, they're, they're, it's, it's people that are, the, but the people that think about what they do, that they have a balance between thinking and, and doing and, um, and uh, trying to actually share something of, of substance. I, you know, Tim Tackett is great. And I'm glad that you have Chris Kent on. on. And um, so, uh, yeah, maybe even, um, oh, I'll figure it out. Oh, are, is is that the is that third floor? We're at uh, women's wear and uh, household goods on the elevator. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Did our time just run out for us. No, no, we we've, we've got we've got uh, sixteen minutes. Wow. Or wow. or thereabouts. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, okay. So, all right. Well, look, I I really appreciate this. Uh, let me do the the official closing. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, guys, thanks very much to Steve Grody for spending some time with us. Feel free to share, like, and comment, ask questions. Um, Steve told you where is the best place to get in touch with him. There's, <laughs> there's stevegrody.com. There's, uh, there are what, three Facebook pages for you? <laughs> yeah. there's, uh, there's my personal Facebook. There's my uh, graffiti graffiti la page and there's my uh uh there's my uh, steve grody martial arts something something there's also my graffiti la.com if people are interested in that um and, you know i think i think that's in the steve grody.com just for the martial post okay. and I'll try and put something on there soon again so people have a reason to go there yeah. i really appreciate what you're doing dwight and and i'm sure many people do so yeah, it, it, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a great time. Okay, all right. If you're in LA, if you're in LA, coffee's on me. Okay, oh yeah. All right, so uh, let's...